Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Walt Houck. I'm Vice President of Product Development for a company you probably have never heard of, Haymanetics. We are a company that makes blood processing equipment. So we supply the blood bags and the machines for people like the American Red Cross. We provide all the software and hardware for blood banks. So if you go to a hospital and have a transfusion, somewhere along the way, one of my products has saved your life. That H-A-A, -A, well actually, you could do it right here. We recently embarked on an IoT journey, and I'm going to give you a short story about what we did this week. We consider ourselves the leader in blood management. That's all the way from making the disposable bags to the machines that process blood to the machines that do diagnostics in blood. If you heard about the shootings in Chattanooga a few weeks ago, those five Marines, we tried to save their lives with a device called the TEG 6S monitoring their hemostasis as those poor men were going through a significant trauma. We also make products like the Hemobank that allows blood bankers to keep rigid control of their product and get it as close to the patient in their surgical suite as possible. These are important life-saving products. We have about 50,000 devices in the field and over the next couple of years we should be just sure of 100,000. The challenge was of course they're not connected. They're just bricks. They do a very important clinical job, but then you take the output of those devices and write down the answer. For all the money we've spent in healthcare, the supply chain is in no way integrated yet. So we set about to change that story for our devices. And we started small. There's a grand vision, but you got to take the first step. And the first step was integrating our legacy devices. We have thousands in the field. How do you put wireless, wired on these devices? How do you not interrupt current operations? That was the task of the first 12 months. And of course, we're going through a product refresh. So we're going from old devices that look square to new sexy devices that look like that. Building those devices so that they had innately IoT capability, rich alerting, usage reporting, all the kind of diagnostics you'd expect. You know, our prior model was you'd walk up to one of our devices with a USB stick, put in the USB stick, download the data, take it over to your computer, and find out what was wrong. That's acceptable, but it won't be much longer. So we had to move to a real-time connected infrastructure. A couple of tough choices. The average lifespan of our devices is 20 years, so we made a decision very early on that the endpoint devices would only have our software. Now we're a hardware manufacturing company. That was a big, scary decision to make. But as we looked at IoT vendors, that was the first choice that said, I'll put an agent on, but I can only put it on in a place where I can control the infrastructure, and that's at a concentrator that we call HemaConnect. All our devices talk to HemaConnect. HemaConnect has the cloud agent that allows it to talk to IoT. It's a different model than many people are going after, but we worried about lifespan, and we worried about being network sparing for our customers. Because frankly, hospital networks are a challenge. You don't control them, you don't manage them, sometimes you can't get signal. So we had to make sure that we weren't building a system that relied on the network always being there. One of the bright stories I would tell you is with our partnership in Brightwolf, that our cloud offering went from a basic design to a prototype in less than three months. That will be in production in six months. And we did it for a fraction of the price that anyone thought was possible. My big learning out of this experience is the IoT infrastructure is here. There are partners that can get you to production right away. That was a huge positive step for us. We're really excited by the partnership. Thank the Bright Wolf guys. Our offering sounds kind of simple, but it has been transformative for the company. Imagine telling your sales force every day what your customers are doing with your products. Sounds like a good idea. Imagine monitoring your devices so that when they have a problem, you can predict it and react to it. And we're starting to build out the kind of self-service things that have existed in other industries for a long time, like training, like getting new pieces of software. All that was taken out of the medical device environment because of regulation, and we're slowly, monotonically moving it forward. And of course, we're going to see lots of new ways to monetize data, research tools, getting best practice codified and put on the devices, our ability to offer uh, services at a much lower cost and a much higher margin. 
all the things that we talk about and promise we're starting to experience. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, here's device management. It's not their platform, it's our platform. But here's the idea. These six life-saving devices sitting in a place where anyone can monitor them. There's some great examples here. I'm not suggesting use ours. This is the one we built. It allows a device manager, a lab manager, a clinician to manage your thousands of devices distributed around the world. If you look at some hospital systems, they are in Cleveland Clinic and Abu Dhabi, and they're part of the same IT infrastructure. Global health is happening. We're just working hard to make it possible. And it's a funny thing, this simple report that we put in Salesforce.com that says to our salesmen, this is what your customer did yesterday has had a competitive gain for us, and its story looks like this. Hi, Dr. So-and-so. I see you've been using our Tag 6X product, and I see you're running usage of it twice as fast as you predicted. Would you like me to sell you more supplies? Doctors inevitably say, yes, I would. Please call my lab manager, and that's the end of the transaction. That's happening today. We were doing it on monthly reports. We were showing up occasionally. We were not able to see what our customers were doing in real time with our devices. And now we are. And now we're starting to leverage that data to do better customer service, better sales, right now, right today. So the value of IoT showed up in the first 15 minutes, not two years after we made the investment. And that's been an exciting learning for all of us. So putting it all together, we use the Brightwolf platform to make a Internet of Things service provider. We've taken all that data and pushed it to our downstream enterprise systems, whether it's things like Salesforce, where you do simple things like utilization and error reporting. How many salesmen have walked in blind to an angry customer and never been able to complete their sales cycle because they didn't know of a service problem? We're not going to live like that anymore. We're going to connect everything. We're going to make sure that when we have a service problem, we're great and reactive, and we're getting better at predictive. Now, we're only six months into this journey, so our predictive database is pretty small. Ma'am? Repeat the question, too. You're worried about um, security and privacy, and I think there are two issues here. One of the issues, certainly on data privacy, is we take any patient identifiable information out of the stream. So there's no HIPAA compliance issues. But I would tell you that we spend a ton of time with hospital security officers proving that over and over and over again. Right? So you've got to have the right search. You've got to have the right infrastructure. You've got to have the right partners to do it. And then you've got to have a routine checklist to prove that every time. Every day and challenged and pushed, right. And that's good, that's good. You've got to work with partners that have the right certs and they're gonna to have to pass them down to you in the right contract law. Do the customers know about the security? Well, that's the customer for us, yes. So, and we have to educate them on why it's good. So I would say that hospital administrators say, SSL, that's terrible, you have to use TSL. Well, do you really know what that means, right? Well, we need military-grade encryption. Are you sure, right? Because your network doesn't have it, so you're holding me to a higher standard, and that's a good educational discussion. In the end, we don't really rely on our customers' security infrastructure. I think all the people here would agree that if you want to have a secure system, you've got to own it. Even though there are layers, you've got to make sure you've got control of the data at every step. So that's how we handle it. We strip out data, privacy data along the platform, except in a particular case where we're doing clinical trials and that has a higher level of security, but that's a separate stream. Correct. There's an Intel discussion about whether or not you can have direct control of a machine. I think one of the important parts of our architecture is we don't allow that. We don't allow someone sitting in the cloud 
to change the parameters on that machine. There's a local security here, and there's security there. So we don't ever close that loop. Hey, Walt, let's, let's, why don't you two talk offline after sure. it goes through the presentation? Also, there's another aspect of this I want to remind myself, which is the truth of the matter is that I, as a donor, once I give the blood, my role is limited. It's actually the relationship on the match that matters more at that point. Surely. Surely. Anyway, I guess to summarize, it's been an exciting 18 months as we've taken kind of a bricks and mortar medical device company and made it a connected blood company. Um, we've had some great partners. It's going to take us a couple more years as we roll through the fleet of our devices. You don't do this all in one day, and we won't. But our medical devices will continue to move forward, will continue to be connected, and I think we're going to get a lot of value out of it. And then the big learning for me was there's partners and products out there that can make it go a heck of a lot faster than we ever thought was possible. All right, Carl? I am. Because... Because I want to just get a little bit more from you. Because you haven't said any things that I've heard in our discussions about you for quite some time. So what's the life cycle of blood outside of human beings? Uh, 42 days. 42 days. So if we don't use it by 42 days... You should throw it away. Okay. And that's kind of a general rule. Blood has componentry. Some as short as five days, some as long as 42. Okay. So... Amongst the things you're measuring, then, is also the life cycle of the blood. Absolutely. Okay. And are there aftermarkets for blood? I mean, is it, is it like stock and, and, or, or futures and, and uh, shorts? Um, there, there shouldn't be. But there is. I um, didn't say that. Okay. Uh, um, so, so if I asked you to give me the one thing that we can do as... as as people, you know, one thing that occurred to me was when we've had conversations about you and, you know, David and James and other James, we all talk about you all the time. So I apologize for that. I know your ears are burning. Um, but after 9-11, people gave so much blood and basically it disappeared. So there's a need for consistency, right? There's a need to continually give blood. To ca so you want to talk a little bit about that as the the peaks and valleys of the of you know people reacting to a crisis and sure sure I, I mean the blood industry is one of those fascinating things everyone donates you know and my parents generation donated because they thought it was societally good and they just did you know this new generation donates for a very different set of things and one of our big challenges is working with our customers to make sure that they reach them in the way that they're going to be reached everyone knows you would market to a millennial the same way you would market to me we're struggling to learn that in the blood industry very right. much, and we're starting to build products to do that. So, so I, we've got people who, like, in my area, I've got towns that, that will only use your own blood for your operations. You know, we've got those kind of hospitals. Yep. So you're also managing that kind of life cycles, too, as well, right? Absolutely. Okay. But in the end, right, when you need the blood, you need the blood. I'll, I'll tell you a positive story. In Indianapolis, um, we were putting our fridges in a hospital, and a police officer was shot. And the hospital, in a cost-saving measure, had moved the blood center a mile and a half off-site. Makes good sense. You don't need all the blood in that big inventory. This man required 300 units of blood to save his life. And they tell the story of nurses running up and down the street with pails to give blood into the surgical suite so they could squeeze it into that person. It took seven hours to save his life. Things like the hemobank would put 80 or 100 or 200 units of blood right there so you wouldn't have that worry and those are the kind of problems we're working on. Excellent. Please give Walt a round of applause.